So, hi and welcome to our next panel on intergenerational contracts this time. I have three experts with me. First, I like to present to you uh, Anna P. Santos, an award-winning journalist from the Philippines. And then we have Jose Dutschke, director of the Department of Health and Care at the Municip municipality of Aarhus in Denmark. And last but not least, we have Alberto Cabanes, CEO and founder of Adata un Abuelo, which probably means something like grand grandparent. <laughs> from Madrid, uh, Spain. Uh, he's the founder of a startup that offers intergenerational experiences to the ones willing to pay for it. We are very curious to learn more about that in a minute. But first, let's start with a video that Anna shot during her research on migrant care workers and the intergenerational disturbances that causes for many families in the Philippines. si Mrs. Norma Brion, 40 years old. Ako ay domestic helper here in UAE. Tatlo ang alaga ko dito ang bata. Uh, may dalawa akong anak, si Jim and Joy. Ako po si Joy Pujawan, 19 years old. At dalawa po kami magkakapatid and uh, broken family po kami actually. Kahihiwalay lang namin mag-asawa. So naisip ko na hindi ko kayang buhayin ang dalawa kong anak. So, masakit man sa akin na iwan sila dahil malilit pa, uh, gumawa ako ng paraan para makapunta dito sa Abu Dhabi. Grade 5 po ako noon, nung uh, nagpaalam po or nagsabi po sa amin yung nanay ko na alis siya at magkatrabaho abroad. Nung umpisa, hindi ako makapagpaalam, hindi ko masabi na may apply ako sa Abu Dhabi dahil alam kong hindi nila kayang tanggapin na aalis ako. Nagpaalam ako nung eksaktong aalis na ako. Yung araw na mismo na alam nila na nakagayak na yung gamit ko. Siyempre po, nalungkot po kami. Tsaka bata pa po kami nun eh, kaya umiyak po kami nun nung umalis po yung nanay ko. Nakita kong umiiyak sila at sinasabi nila na wag akong umalis, na doon na lang kami sa, sa Pilipinas na magsama-sama dahil uh, hindi nila kayang lumayo ako sa kanila. Mahirap po yun para sa amin kasi parang dalawang taon na po yung nawala sa amin or sa family po namin. Nasabi ko po na uh, kung hindi po umalis ang tatay ko noon, hindi po po sana magiging ganito yung buhay namin. Parang hindi po kailangan umalis ng nanay ko noon para maghanap ng trabaho sa ibang bansa. Mga apat na taon nung nakalipas, nung bumalik ako ng Pilipinas. Uh, third year high school na si Jim and second year high school na si Joy. Kasi hindi ko sinabi na uuwi ako, sinurprise ko sila. So, doon ko nakita na miss na miss nila ako dahil uh, nung, umuwi, nung umuwi sila galing school, nakita nila ako doon at sabi nila, kailan ka dumating? Ang feeling ko po nung umuwi yung nanay ko, syempre po masaya kasi at least makikita na po siya, parang makakasama na po namin siya. Niyakap ko sila, tapos tuwan-tuwa ako. Nasabi ko na sa akin nila na namiss ko kayo. Umalis ulit ako ng 2009. And nagpaalam ako sa kanila na may apply uli ako, aalis uli ako, pero hintay nila at babalik din ako. Uh, umiiyak sila, nasabi nila, bakit kailangan laging umalis at iwan kami? Totally po, 8 years na po siya nagtatrabaho sa Abu Dhabi as domestic helper po. Dalawang best pa lang po siya nakakauwi. Uh, sa lahat ng graduation ng mga anak ko, hindi nila ako nakakasama, hindi ako nakaka-attend. Uh, ang nanay ko ang naghahatid sa kanila sa estate. Ang nanay ko lahat ang gumagampan na dapat ay ako na gumampan bilang isang ina. Ang nag-aalaga po sa amin nung kuya ko, yung lola ko po. Mahirap po kasi syempre po, halimbawa po, pag nagkakasakit po ako, syempre po parang feeling po na na hindi po talaga yung tunay mong nanay nag-aalaga sa'yo. Again po yung hinahanap ko sa nanay ko, yung presence ng po niya. 
gusto ko lahat ng iisipin ko at lahat ng sasabihin ko sa kanila hindi sasama ang loob nila sa akin kasi ayoko na sumama ang loob nila sa akin at ayoko ng sabihin nila na bakit mo kami iniwan at lumayo ka Nangangarap ako na magkaroon ng bagong phone uh, para tumatawag ako sa pamilya ko, sa mga anak ko, nakakausap ko sila ng maayos. So, nakita nung alaga ko na yung phone ko ay eh, 3315, so parang naawa siya. Uh, Pinabirdihan naman nila ako ng laptop. Kasi sabi ng amo ko, para daw kung magkausap kami ng anak ko, nag nakikita ko sila at nakikita din nila ako. Ano po, syempre po, yung through internet or through phone, kahit na araw-araw yun po po yung pag-uusap, parang iba pa rin po pag yung kasama po talaga. Ang pangarap ko po, parang syempre po, hindi na po siya may trabaho doon, hindi na po talaga siya mag-stay at makasama po namin siya. Ang pangarap nila, makatapos talaga ng pag-aaral at magkabahay kami. Nasama-sama na kami na hindi na, hindi na kami maghihiwalay. <clears throat> oh, Anna, thank you. Thank you for this uh, research, Anna. As a mother, this movie kind of uh, leaves me a little bit breathless. Uh, maybe can you give us a little bit of a background uh, on the Philippines? So which kind of formal or informal contracts exist between the generation? Uh, in, in, uh, on, and what kind of role does the state play in that? Thank you, Yana, for having me and help. good afternoon to everyone here. You know, Yana, like you, I'm, I'm also a mother. So, you know, covering the context of the migrant mothers like Norma Brion in this film is also very heart-wrenching. You know, you can't help but think about what it means for you as a mother also when you have to uh, leave your children in order to provide a future for them. Every day there are thousands of Filipino women like Norma Brion who leaves the Philippines to work abroad. And um, you know the Philippines is one of the largest labor suppliers in the world. This is very much a function of you know, the state-sponsored labor migration policy. So in Germany, you'll see many Filipinos as seafarers and um, nurses. And you know, you're talking about how these intergenerational disturbances come because of migration. In the case of migrant mothers, where they care for young and the very young and the very vulnerable populations of other Western countries, you really see a change in the families, the generational families and the kinship in both the family that she leaves behind who have to adapt and reconfigure themselves and think about what their roles and functions are within the family to cope with her absence, but also in the families that she takes care of, you see that these families expand to also accommodate her presence as someone who performs love-based transactions, meaning you care for children who are not your own, but perform very intimate tasks like um, putting them to bed, nursing them when they're sick. So this is the kind of generational impact that we see labor migration taking. And what does the state, what is the, the realm of the state on this? Is this something that they do encourage? Is it something that they do not want? So how is, is there a state-fueled uh, intergenerational contract? Are there pensions pay, being paid? Or how does it work? So tell us a little bit more about the, the system maybe in the, in the Philippines. The social contract, your social protection in the Philippines can be summarized by one word, your family. So, you know, the, the social protection systems are very weak in terms of what you think about for healthcare, for example, and pensions. Those are the things that everyone, regardless of your social class, would have to think about and encounter, right? How am I going to take care of myself when I am sick? How am I going to take care of myself when I am old and can no longer work for myself? 
So since the social protections institutionalized by the state are very weak in this sense, um, and I say the weak in terms of the coverage and also how you, know, you qualify for such protections, because they're very weak, what stands in is your family. And that's why, you know, I, I've been asked, some of you who have watched this film may be wondering, how can these mothers leave their children? And the answer to that is also found in how our social protections lie so much and are dependent so much on our family. You know, they leave their children because this is a way to provide them a chance, a better chance, a better opportunity at life. And what, are, what, what I mean, in, in, in this movie, we saw that the grandmother is performing her mother, a motherhood for a second time, actually, for her grandchildren. How is this generation leading with the idea that they, they, they do have to re-perform as, as parents again at an age where they're actually not really prepared anymore for, for these kinds of uh, puberty turbulences that uh, grandchildren's might. <laughs> you, th you think you're through with that, right? You've gone through parenthood and you're done with those really troublesome, angsty teenagers and then you have to do it all over again as a grandmother. It's true. There are um, a lot of stories of uh, grandmothers, grandparents will say grandparenthood is better because you have the children for shorter periods of time and you don't have to deal with disciplining and all the very cumbersome things that come with parenthood. But in the case of these families that we were talking about, how they adapt to the absence of the mother who has to work abroad, that's it. You really see a lot of the grandmothers or the older women, the sisters in the family taking over as the head of the household. For the grandparents, it's a it's really a mix. Yeah, now some of them will say that okay, I like that um, I'm very close to my grandchildren, and I feel so needed, right? There's a sense of I'm needed in my in my senior years. I am still very much recognized, respected, and cherished by my family because of the role I play. But on the other hand, it's like oh my god, these teenage years that I thought I would have to I I've, I'm done with. I have to live through again. And I have to add, you know, the same sacrifices that you had to make as a parent where, okay, I need to budget and therefore I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to indulge on myself. I will just spend it on my children. The grandmother who was left behind is also the, the, the budgeter of the finances and ha still has to make these everyday decisions. So when you think about your old age as, a, as an age where, oh, I can indulge myself a little bit more because I'm done with the caring responsibilities and I've graduated from that these grandmothers have to go through it again. It's another period of sacrifice for them. I think we're coming back on that, uh, talking about uh, Alberto's business model, but um, maybe one last question to you. Um, you mentioned that this giving love and this caring, you, 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 you stressed uh, uh, that, that the, the work that these women yes. do in, 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 their, in their guest families or in, at their work, is really like giving love and caring for people, even though this is a no skilled or, or low skilled work and therefore also low paid. Is, is there any way, so what do you think? Can caring and giving love be paid adequately? I think so. I think I, I, it's a very tough question to answer because you know, on an emotional level, these transactions, the, the work that a migrant mother, a migrant nanny has to perform, they're acts of love. And in our heads, we don't compensate those things um, you know, financially because they are given by people who love us and, and are you know, obligated to take care of us. But when we think about the kind of care that we need from, from migrant mothers especially, I think that we should look at the growing number of children who have been cared for by migrant nannies who are coming out with work that say that, you know, I think of her as my family. She's not an employee. I'm talking about films like one that was just done by Justin Cheng. He's a Hong Kong national. His Filipino nanny took care of him for 22 years. There's another Singaporean cookbook by, I pardon me, I cannot remember the, mm -hmm. the author's name, but he wrote a cookbook based on... Um, recipes that were passed down to him from his Filipino and Indonesian nanny. 
a photographer mm. in Singapore has just put up an exhibit, a tribute to her nanny who was taking care of her for over 20 years because her nanny, will, her Filipino nanny, will have to go back to the Philippines and retire mm. because of citizenship restrictions in Singapore. I think when we look at that, which is a hugely understudied area, we see that these transactions are not low skilled, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. something that can be paid on the low or on the cheap. They're invaluable. These are emotionally laden acts of care that these women do for these children who are and the elderly who are entrusted in their care. Thank you. I think we, we stick to this the the, the, the the motto of love or the, the, the emphasis on love. Jose, you're also very much concerned with giving love and caretaking. You are representing one of the best welfare states here in the world. Nobody in Denmark has so far to be afraid of getting old uh, alone or uh, uh, impoverished or losing their job. There seems to be enough care for everybody provided by the state. So that's our fantasy from, from the outside. <laughs> Why uh, was there a need? Because you developed the concept of the loving municipality. What does that mean? Uh, yes. 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 Thank you, and uh, thank you, Anna. Very interesting uh, to hear about a completely different system uh, compared to the Danish one. And uh, thank you to you, Jana, and to Weimar for being here today. Uh, and as Jana said, uh, we are indeed uh, kind of in a different place than in the Philippines and in Denmark. I don't know if we're a land of uh, honey and milk, but. Uh, that depends how you look at it, because uh, love doesn't come from the state, it comes from people. But as a leader in the public welfare state, uh, my approach uh, to today's talk about generations is about uh, the opportunities that we can do by engaging our younger generations and how we as a welfare state can support and make it more to a development of a society instead of, <clears throat> what should you say, a welfare state that does everything for you. But uh, let me tell you a little about the backgrounds for this. Uh, for the last 10, 15 years, we've been looking at, uh, well, we have, of course, in Denmark, a big welfare state, universal help, almost everything, uh, maybe except love. But, but every, you can really get a lot of help with a lot of different things in the welfare state in Denmark. I mean, pay your education, you can go to the hospital, have the kindergartens for everybody and uh, leave uh, if you get if children and uh, all kinds of stuff like that. So we are one of the, uh, in that sense, we have a big welfare state, but uh, we are as other countries in Europe, looking at the problem that uh, we get a lot more older people and uh, was going like this with the young people and some places even like that. Uh, that means, of course, these challenges uh, where we uh, have a welfare state that helps people with everything by employed people uh, at some point that is going to be not possible. So uh, we had to look at these uh, challenges, uh, challenges in, in new ways. Because uh, when we just look at this and Germany, I think is even worse actually there. Um, that uh, the tax and the and the manpower, woman power that comes uh, is just going down and the elderly people that have to get help or don't pay taxes anymore and even get provided from the state, that's not gonna stand very long, uh, looking like the next five, 10, and maybe even not even that much in Germany. I think in Denmark, we have taken some measures to make it a few years more though, but, uh, and looking at that, that is probably the biggest uh, challenge we have in, uh, in our 100 year Danish welfare state. Uh, so, and of course we could sit us down and uh, be sad or uh, given up, uh, but uh, we wanted to change the rhetorics and change it upside down and meet these challenges by rethinking the traditional roles that we have here between, uh, you could say the task between the public sector and the citizens of Aarhus. As a result of that, uh, we came with this concept of the loving municipality uh, and took that to life. And that of course um, made some discussions, but uh, the core element of that is uh, we create welfare together. I mean, it's not just the state coming and giving welfare 
of our kinds, we have to make and uh, create this welfare together. That means families like Anna was into have to become more uh, in, into this. Uh, this could be in the schools, this could be in the, in the elderly care or other things. Today, we have it like you have rights, a lot of rights in Denmark. You can choose and pick from almost everything where we're uh, at the municipality. So we had to, instead of just having a standard and a lot of different welfare services, we wanted to change it. So we got back to what is it we can do together with the citizens and how can they provide? That could be within generations uh, together. Uh, it could be, uh, as a one example, we have um, a house of generation that we built where different generations live together. I mean, almost a thousand people come into this house uh, uh, a day. Uh, here we try to combine, instead of you just get your rights and your services, you are part of the welfare and especially you're part of the relations. And uh, that's what we wanted to do, make more room and space for relations so people could meet between generations instead of only having relations to the state and the employees. Relations are just more interesting and love comes with and between people. So our whole goal of the loving municipality is to make spaces and room and meeting points for people to meet and hopefully help each other also. And I mean, we didn't exactly put the welfare state down in Denmark so you can still get help, but we wanna make this movement because movement at the end of the day, that's what uh, uh, it takes away loneliness. And uh, as you know, uh, loneliness or being apart, if you don't have somebody to be with, uh, sure. uh, is killing and it's gonna make it even more expensive. And then the welfare state will even look worse because we still have yeah. a big universal. Thank you. I think uh, this is exactly what uh, your uh, di diagnosis was, Alberto. <laughs> I think you, you, you said that, uh, Maybe you tell us a little bit more. I mean, you said that loneliness kills. You had an experience, not about killing, but about <laughs> loneliness, and being adopted by uh, or, or adopting a grandparent, a new grandparent next to your own. So um, yeah, how how does that that idea that Hazir is now presenting combine somehow as the other part of the medal on what you're doing on a entrepreneurial? Uh, way and this is, I think, the interesting difference maybe between uh, uh, the municipality uh, and and also the family-based uh, uh, contract. What kind of contracts are you handing out to whom, Alberto? Oh yes, hello everyone. Uh, well, in my case, we have an app that connects uh, elderly people that they are isolated with young people that want to learn values and wisdom. What, what we say in other grandparents is that uh, any elder can tell you better stories than Netflix. So we have like a big library of uh, elderly people in our platform. And what we do is to connect with, with young people. And what is really innovative for us, because when we launched the, the app, uh, we thought about we need a more young people is that we have uh, much more young people that want to participate than elderly people. So, so looking for the business model and the sustainability uh, model, um, we see that if we charge a little amount of uh, young people, so they can uh, access to all of this information and, and events. And it's working. And right now in Spain, we have an app uh, that uh, uh, young people is paying for learn values and wisdom from the elderly people. And well, we have different programs. The, the, the star program that we have is the recurrent model. So we match a, a pair of volunteers that they go to, to a nursing home to visit the, the elderly people, or they can do a, a call or video call through our app. And we have other events that they are really cool. For example, we have grandpa's foodies so we go to a fancy restaurant with uh, people of 90 years old, with uh, people of 20 years old. And you can imagine when we enter in the, in the restaurant, all the people is looking at, at, at us. Uh, we have also beers with grandpas. So we also go for, for having a beer. We have trips with grandpas. We have also uh, grandpas influencers 
So for us, uh, we do like tech talks with a lot of uh, elderly people that they have a lot of experience to, to share with young people. Um, and it's fully booked because they, they tell us uh, great stories. And, and well, what, what we do in, in Adult Grand Parent is this, is to combat isolation through different events and, and activities. Um, and we find, well, we, we work for social inclusion of, of elderly people. I think that we have one of the greatest assets in our society and we are not working with them uh, when they have more knowledge and more um, issues and things to, to give to the, to, to the young people. So Jose, yeah, this is something that could relate to you. I mean, there you have young people even paying for uh, giving love and taking experiences. What, what do you think? Is this something that uh, 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 some kind of cooperation or connection between this uh, startups and the municipalities in Europe could be something that would lead to something? Definitely. I think that's a really good idea. And uh... In that sense, getting young people and getting the wisdom from the from the elderly that uh, and doing that with a, an app that could go in different languages. I mean, it's probably going to be hard to make it in Danish. We're still kind of having a, a not very many people speaking that language, but uh, the idea is good. And uh, just as an example, uh, something a little similar, but that's not through an app. Uh, we have what we call at, the, uh, at our nursing homes, at our Pflege, uh, we have uh, young people with kids coming there and uh, being together. Uh, and that's completely stranger people that come to these nursing homes. And, and in that sense, we get the generational uh, talks also going. But uh, doing it over an, an app, and in that sense, also connecting to people that are lonely or living apart or away is a, is a good idea. So, but um, I mean, Alberto, you're planning to, to widen and go global with your uh, idea, maybe, maybe European first. But Anna, would that, how, that, how does it resonate with you? I mean, you hear that 90% of Alberto clients uh, are, are women, first of all. I think Alberto didn't mention that so far, but in the pre-talk he said that actually 90% of the ones who are willing to participate and take care are women, okay. And... Um, and on the other hand, um, they pay, uh, Alberto, you said nine euros per month um, to take care or be in, 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 in company of the elderly. So, Anna, would that something, would that be a business model that would work in the Philippines? First of all, Alberto, I, I cannot wait to be a Spanish grandmother. Hearing your story, I, I mean, I wanted to be a Spanish grandparent and have <laughs> young people come and visit me and I tell them all these stories. It sounds fantastic. I'm not entirely sure how that would work for Philippines. It's such a close, you know, I talked about how in the Philippines, your, your social protection system is your family. But, you know, underneath that is also we're very close to one another in terms of families. It's still very, not very widely accepted to think about having other people care for your mother, your elderly mother or your grandparents. It really will fall on um, me to take care of my mom and um, uh, um, me also to take care of our grandparents and her the same way she would be expected to take care of the grandparents. So I, I think in that aspect of maybe companionship, sure, that would probably alleviate the kind of um, the, the expectation because more and more it's, uh, you cannot have uh, one parent, one income earner households also. So that old kind of cultural model for caring for your elderly yourself is becoming less and less viable for sure as the generations go on. Like many parts of the world, both parents have to work, you know, or, or people have to work all the time. So um, that's going to be less and less viable. And maybe that's something that can ease into the culture, you know, but up right now, it, I think it would be, it's a, it would be a, a bit of a departure from what we're used to in, in the Philippines and what we expect uh, from each other, from the, the generations, younger generations to take care of us. Uh, we hope, I mean, that it's not an obligation, but more of a joy to take care of those who have um, taken care of you. Is it a joy? 
Um, it's that's what I was saying, you know, um, in before the when you had more time to to let work less, you know, all of these things, uh, you could have one income households. I think that's fine. It's the same thing now, right? Why are why are au pairs in Denmark taking care of of children in the Danish home despite all of the social welfare protections? It's really because of the demands of of work and life itself. So I think more than what is culturally what we've been used to, what we've culturally been accepted, what culturally accepted, and what's culturally taboo, it'll really be dictated by. The economic imperatives of providing for your family. Thank you. Um, there's also the possibility of questions from the audience. So please write them into the chat and I will be happily forwarding them also to the speakers. We have about so yeah, 10 minutes left. Um, so um, what would you, any of you, um, recommend me <laughs> or a younger person maybe, but I'm, I'm, I'm facing another 20 years of working and then I'm thinking about retiring, but I do now have a, a little bit of a question mark if this is going to work the way I think it would work. Um, what would you actually um, recommend me to do? I mean, the state is saying, well, you have to have your private pension and you have to to, to care for yourself, but I can't even uh, save enough money like and put it on the side at the moment. I'm living in Munich and the rents are very high. Um, so what would you recommend me to do? Just save love or, or care or get more children? Or what, was, <laughs> what would be your recommendation for me in order to have uh, a decent uh, senior life? Or is there, is there no hope at all? Denmark, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, different. Comes uh, from the perspective, but uh, I mean, in Denmark, they just, as I said, uh, made a reform where we actually have to work longer. But then, on the other hand. We also live to a, like, I don't know how old the, the young ones born now, they live to their hundreds. So, I mean, I'm still looking at a lot of years without work if we don't work more. Uh, so it, I think we actually should work uh, at least as many years as we do now or more. But then of course we have, a, have to help each other making work. So work is joyful and uh, is fun and, uh, and also doable to work those many years and have relations at your work with the with the with the uh, both the employees the colleagues but also with the citizens uh, so it, in that sense make interesting jobs but i mean that's a danish view at it anna what was your recommendation for me is there anything that i can learn from the philippine I, I was I was going to think about you know the the thing that you combat more and more I think as a as an older person and Alberto you pointed this out and it was is really the loneliness so you know I think that the aspect of thinking about what what may cause you loneliness and then kind of addressing that whether it's through an app like um, like Alberto has and, and and connecting you with young people or through your various hobbies and and also being self-sufficient it's so important to be self-sufficient but um i was thinking about where this discussion was going when you when you mentioned i mean in the in the countries that you've, you've that you've talked about spain denmark and and germany it's really going you know the sustainability of providing for the elderly population in the same way that we are doing now is going to be it's a little untenable or you know it has to it's, it's a little unstable and as a as a coming from the, a country that supplies labor, or you know, I think that just means that labor migration from emerging economies providing care for the vulnerable populations of the elderly and the very young will continue to flow into the industrialized countries. That's going to be the standard. That's going to be the norm more and more. And so we're going to be thinking about how this reconfigures families on both ends of the migration spectrum. But as, as I had said earlier, this also demands that we look at the kind of work that's being done here. It is not something that you, you pay, you know, it's, it's emotional-based work. 
it's emotional labor. It's love-based tasks that are invaluable. And I would still continue to say that that's why we need to declassify uh, domestic work from the labor caste of unskilled labor and give it the respect and the dignity that it deserves as a job and as a profession. Anna, there's a question for you from the audience and, mm -hmm. and that, that goes into the direction. Are there any NGOs or any laws or activists pushing for clearer laws, for example, for these uh, mothers, nannies uh, to do their work? Is there, is there an, a lobby? Absolutely. There's a very strong labor rights ma ma lobby, not just in the Philippines, but also in the countries of destination where we have large migrant, Filipino migrant populations. I'm currently in the UK, and there is also a very strong migrant community here pushing for better, better protections against, you know, the emerging um, difficulties, the migrant difficulties changes over certain periods of time. For example, now that we see a, a rising anti-Asian um, sentiment, you know, so that's the kind of thing that we have to, that we have to think about. So definitely there are a lot of um, NGOs, but what I'm also saying is that I think we need to think about what, not just what the Philippine based NGOs and labor rights groups are doing, but also what the countries of destination are doing to protect the labor rights and protections of their migrant workers. It's a dual responsibility because this person, this worker, may be a national of another country, but they are spending their most productive years away from their families and contributing to the sustainability and productivity of the economies that they work in and therefore should be better protected as well. Thank you. There's another question, um, and maybe Alberto Josea, this is maybe directed uh, to you, is creating welfare together seems a good concept to make it successful. To what extent has, for example, a curriculum in the early school system has to be re-engineered? So Alberto, is there other programs that you're doing, for example, together with schools, Josea? Is there something that you're doing in schools in order to provide like the concept of the loving, starting the concept of the loving municipality? Alberto, maybe too. Well, we work with uh, a lot of uh, schools and university, but it's true that it's not mandatory and it's not part of uh, the curriculum. It's just like an extra uh, activity at school. Um, so many, many young people want to do it, the, want to do the program, but it's not a mandatory um, activity to do. But are you you handing out uh, uh, um, certificates also for those uh, who participated in your program? Haven't you? Yes, we we do, we we do diff we have uh, diplomas for everyone when when the, the when the course is finished. But it's true that that we don't have like an any special regulation or or law that that, that allow us to, to do this. We do because uh, it's our recognition to the participant of, of the program. But I really think that uh, maybe in, in a schools or university, there, there should be a, a mandatory curriculum, not only for the elders, just for social impact initiatives. So, so I think it's, it's, it's very important because they are going, well, people or students are going to engage with real problems in society. And, and, and I think it's, it's, it's very useful for, for, for everyone. So, uh, Jose, maybe we need uh, uh, in school, if no, nowadays we have a lot of, of classes and extra programs for girls going into technical uh, uh, professions. Um, having Alberto's numbers, maybe we need uh, courses and classes for boys going into care work. Is this something the Denmark is already planning on? Well, yeah, in some ways, I mean, it's definitely mostly women that work there, but uh, we have had different places where we actually tried to make a real effort to get uh, men in. And uh, it helps when there are more at once, then you can get even more in. So we did have some uh, nursing homes where actually up to 40% were men. But I think in Spain, they're actually pretty much better to doing that with the nurses. Uh, a system, an uh, educational system is just really a lot of women in, in Denmark also uh, at the nurses and at the, at the normal uh, people that take care of the elder. But in Spain, they were actually pretty good doing uh, getting a lot of 
comparable to Denmark, at least a lot of men into the nursing uh, system. Um, so they get educated there. But what we else, uh, we also make that at the House of the Generations, we have a kindergarten, a big kindergarten there, and they come and meet. And in that sense, we make connections also with from really newborns till six mm -hmm. years. And we have uh, between schools, nursing homes, and uh, we make them meet. Uh, so we and make a different uh, uh, what do you call that uh, contracts um, between them so in that sense we're really trying to to make it happen and to the curric curriculum thing uh, actually a lot of uh, people young people in Denmark are thinking when they want to go uh, they have it uh, they have a half a year where they do a kind of uh, volunteer stuff of, of these kinds because that is actually important uh, okay, to so get a job yeah Okay, thank you. So maybe we're coming to the end of the session, but there's a last question from the audience and maybe each of one has uh, its own view on that question. And of course, it has to do something to do with something that we are all were very concerned with in the last two years. And the question is, uh, if in your point of view, if the p pandemic um, has, has um, has changed our view on care work because we've been seeing that uh, you had the example, you, you, you wrote an article in the Berliner Zeitung today, Anna, uh, saying how all the migration workers from the Philippines returned to the Philippines now because of the pandemic. And uh, Hosea probably in the elderly's homes, uh, the, the loneliness where a flood does. So the question is, does loving and caring uh, work in, in times of social distancing and how what does it, has it changed or what were your experiences? Anna, maybe you start. I was thinking about earlier two things while you know we were, we've been talking. One is um, how in the pandemic, you know, we had to really parse our, our lives, right? Right down to what we said, only the essentials, you know? And I think that that was a, wake-up call to us to see that this is essential work the kind the caregiving is so much a uh, part of what we consider as essential work um and not just our our health frontliners but also you know the ones providing the home support whether it's for the young children or for the elderly population secondly i was thinking about how you know the your your respective countries have really good models for social protection in terms of financially providing for your older years which is great in the twilight years and i was thinking so much about um you know the aspect of loneliness and being alone how do you there's it's not a monetary thing that i mean that can be addressed through monetary concerns so i was wondering also how moving forward how we could think about addressing also that loneliness being alone and as an essential need for for care also thank you Alberto. well in in our case um we we finished all the relations in, in in only one week because all the nursing homes were absolutely closed so what we do for, what was to develop a, um, uh, a calls uh, based on, on cloud solution. And, and we uh, start like receiving thousands of calls um, uh, and, and we were with the municipality of Madrid. And it was an incredible feeling because on the one hand, I, we were scared, but on the other hand, what we, what, what we have was um, a, a huge amount of love of young people and elderly people that want to, to participate and, and, and to care of others. So, what I think is, and, and that's important, that uh, the pandemic uh, focus right now on elderly people and how important it is to care about them. And, and, and this thing, I think that's, that's really important and is thanks to the, to the pandemic. Thank you. Osea, last Well, I agree both with, with uh, Anna. I agree both with Anna and Alberto. Uh, 
I mean, definitely the care workers were the heroes in, in Denmark for almost one and a half years. So it's been, uh, in that sense, of course, uh, have they been a big uh, topic. I think uh, to, uh, what Anna said about loneliness was, of course, a real big issue because suddenly they didn't get uh, anybody yeah. to come visit them and only with a mask and everything because we have, of course, everything. So there was a lot, there was a lot of social distance. But what we did uh, was a do, uh, did a, a lot of digitalization and in that sense we made connecting people in new ways but you still of course need to shake hands mm. if we're even allowed to do that anymore and uh, at least give a hug because uh, else we're not going to get loving uh, people back I mean it's nice being yeah. with you guys looking at you as a flat screen but it would certainly be nicer to be together with you because yeah. uh, that does something with love as well and loneliness especially yeah thank you very much um, yeah, so what did I take from the session in order to be prepared uh, for the, the future and, and, and having a, a yeah, being in good intergenerational relations? I think um, I heard that uh, it, it's important to find joyful work with really nice colleagues because we'll stay in that job for a very, very <laughs> long time <laughs> or, or in those jobs or in jobs anyway. So it's really, really important. <laughs> which jobs to choose, then it's very good and very important to really build relations to your children and not only in order to make them care for you, but actually to have this relationship. And I think that's the, um, that's really the work of the parents and not the work of the children to keep up these good relationships uh, with your children, but also have wide and vast private relations and networks that uh, then will you be able to rely on and uh, that will then maybe even take us through more pandemics <laughs> if we use the times in between um, so thank you very much thank you for, very much for your contributions um, thank you very much for your work for raising the awareness on, on certain topics or even um, yeah and and helping to build the future in that sense so thank you very much and bye bye Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Nice.